Tama Japan, I'm Frank Ling. And from Chicago, Illinois, I'm Charles Lee. And you're listening to the Grok Science Show. That's right, it's a weekly look at the world of science, technology, and their effects on our daily lives. Coming up on today's program, Vanessa Woods will join us to discuss but elbow handshake. So stay tuned for all of this. Plus the Grokatron 5000. And our world famous question a week. Coming right up. Here. On the Grok's Science Show. Science show. Well, bonobos are one of our closest living relatives, yet these female-dominated, peace-loving apes are highly endangered. What can we learn from these primate cousins of ours, and what can be done to save these creatures? Join us today to discuss this issue is Ms. Vanessa Woods. Ms. Woods is a writer, researcher, and journalist, currently a research scientist at Duke University. She has authored numerous scientific and popular works on this subject. Her latest release, Bonobo Handshake, a memoir of love and adventure in the Congo, explores this issue for a general audience. Uh, Ms. Woods, thank you very much for joining us today on the Grox Science Oh, show. thank you for having bonobos on your show. <laughs> it's really our pleasure. <laughs> You've written a, a sort of a memoir of your adventures in the Congo. I'm, uh, why did you decide to write the book? We just did a study at Duke, and it turns out that only 25% of people even know that bonobos are a great ape, which I'm taking to mean that they don't even know really what a bonobo is. It's just so surprising that for our closest living relative, there's really so little that we know about them. And the last popular book on bonobos was 13 years ago, so I thought it was about time for another one. <laughs> well, it seems like a, a good time for that. Uh, what, what led you out there? Well, my, I, I met this guy, um, he's really <laughs> super charming, we fell in love, and then he's like, well, I'd been working with chimpanzees before, and he was, well, I'm going to go study bonobos in Congo, do you want to come? Well, you know, it sounds like a little adventure and excitement, but it was just, it was so much more than I bargained for, really, and um, if he asked me to do anything like that again, I'd probably um, say no. <laughs> so you just picked up and left and uh, went, went to go study these bonobos? Just picked up and left. But, I mean, bonobos are just the most extraordinary animals, and I wouldn't have swapped it for anything. It, it, it's an amazing experience. They're quite fantastic. And you're right, it is going to be a huge year for bonobos this year. The bonobo genome is coming out in a few months, so that's really exciting. And then Gruen is writing the first fiction about bonobos called Ape House. So it's going to be a big bonobo year. People are going to be hearing a lot about them. I'm really looking forward to it. <laughs> so what did you learn about bonobos while you are out there? I think the most important thing we learn about bonobos is they are so cooperative. So one of the things we look at as the, that we're interested in is human cooperation and what is it that makes us so cooperative as a species. I mean, we can do these amazing things. Apparently, we're, like, designing life with computers now. Did you see that thing with Craig Venter? So we can do, like, all this amazing stuff, but at the same time, we have these constraints on our cooperation. And so we were just trying to figure out what is cooperation like in our closest living relatives and how does that apply to humans? And we found out that chimpanzees are really extraordinary cooperators. They're in incredibly cognitive in the way that they do it. So they understand much more about cooperation than we thought. They, they know that they need other individuals to cooperate. They're ready to punish individuals who are cheating. So, you know, that was really exciting. But something about chimpanzee cooperation is they're incredibly constrained by their emotions. So if they don't like someone, they can't cooperate with them. And in bonobos, it's, in, it's exactly the opposite. Bonobos, they'll just cooperate with anyone and they're extremely tolerant. And I think this is something extremely important for humans, especially when you look at a, a country like Congo or even the House of Representatives trying to get this sort of bipartisanship going. Well, why is it that sometimes we can manage to do great and then sometimes we just completely fall apart? So a, a lot of people have drawn the distinction of chimp as, as being some more warlike ape and the bonobos being a, a peaceful loving apes. Would you say that's an accurate uh, characterization? I think Yoda said there's the light side and there's the dark side and chimpanzees they definitely have both which is why for the last 40 years they've been this model for human cognition because you know they do they have these wide range of emotions so they're capable of love if you believe the latest news reports they mourn their dead so they're capable of empathy but then they also have this side to them that's extremely murderous and violent so gangs of chimpanzees if you like will go into enemy territories and take an enemy 
enemy male and just torture him to death over a long period of time. And they also have these unattractive behaviours like they beat their females and they kill infants and some of these things they really share with humans. So they're really the whole spectrum. So what a fascinating animal to compare ourselves with. It's kind of like looking in a mirror. But bonobos, I think, they're even more important than chimpanzees in telling us about who we are because they don't have the violence. And so when you're looking at what is the most intelligent ape, then I always say bonobos because despite all our things, like all this stuff that we have and this stuff that we can do, we still have not managed to live without violence. And bonobos do that beautifully. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people like to use the chimpanzee as that model that gives them a natural explanation for why human society can be so warlike. Would you argue then that the focus then on bonobos? Well, bonobos just have a really important lesson to teach us in that, you know, they found a mechanism to resolve tension. Now, for bonobos, it's sex. I'm not <laughs> for a minute suggesting that that's going to be our mechanism, but I think, you know, as a species, we really need to look at bonobos and find out what it is about their psychology, about their biochemistry, and figure out exactly what it is they're doing, and then use our gigantic craniums to then come up with whatever it's going to be for humans, that we can finally attain that wonderful utopia of world peace. <laughs> what is a bonobo handshake? <laughs> it's, really, it's really funny because the publisher has got me on the front cover kind of shaking hands with a bonobo, but that's actually not what a bonobo handshake is. When bonobos meet each other for the first time, when there's a particularly tense situation, any reason at all really, they'll have sex. And people tend to get stuck on this, but for bonobos, it's really not erotic at all. It's just something that's as common and friendly as a handshake. So that's why the book is called Bonobo Handshake. <laughs> Make love, not war, huh? <laughs> that's right. That's right. It's the 60s. The 60s just that kept going. <laughs> you spent time at the uh, Lola Yabonobo Sanctuary. The Loloya Bonobo, it's actually one of the last forests in Kinshasa, which is the capital of Congo, and it used to be the weekend retreat for this notorious dictator called Mobutu Sese Seko. I mean, you know, he was just extraordinary. He spent something like $4 billion before he died, put the country in huge debt, and had these lavish expenses, like, you know, he would fly his jumbo jet to Disneyland, and he would pour truckloads of champagne and caviar from Paris and so this was this sanctuary used to be the place where he would go on the weekends to get out of the dust of the city and so now it is home to over 60 bonobo orphans and they live there quite happily in this gigantic forest and after quite traumatic beginnings where their parents were killed for the bushmeat trade so this is somewhere that they can go where they'll be safe basically. Mm. The person who set this up was Claudine Andre. Yes, Claudine André, she's an absolutely amazing woman. She's Belgian, but she's lived in the Congo for 60 years now. And um, so she started the sanctuary in 1994 with one bonobo. And through all the horrible wars of Congo, everybody, every expat in their right mind left. But she stayed, and she stayed. She would go out into the forest with the bonobos, occasionally dodging bullets just to make sure they had somewhere safe, to find a paradise for them. And she's really done that amazingly. And last year... She she, for the first time ever, released bonobos back into the wild. So it's a nice cycle, a nice story. Hmm. So bonobos, are they uh, fairly endangered? And besides the sanctuary, are there other efforts going to help conservation? Bonobos are extremely endangered. They're actually the most endangered ape. Like, they're in the most trouble of anyone, which is why it's worrying that nobody's heard of them. They're in a lot of trouble. Congo, if you had to pick one country to live in, to be endemic to, it really would not be the Democratic Republic of Congo. <laughs> I mean, they've had a war that sort of lasted for 10 years, and, you know, I think the death toll now is up to 5.4 million, you know, which is approaching a Holocaust proportion, so it, it, it's pretty bad. Um, there are... People People working to protect the Congo. Um, so Claudine Andre set up Friends of Bonobos, which is this um, not-for-profit that is aiming at educating the Congolese and then running the sanctuary. Um, I know the John and Teresa Hart are also working at doing some um, protection, environmental protection and bonobo census. Um, African Wildlife Fund. I think the World Conservation Society is also in Congo. So people are working hard, but it's an, it's an uphill fight. Congo is very, very complicated. What's happening there now? Is there more international efforts coming in to the Congo? Oh, well, ostensibly there's peace. So the last democratic elections, well, actually the first democratic